the, the thing we're going to try and cover on is what are the four types of decisions we deal with? Just kind of give you a quick download, a, a introduction to a decision process, and then, as I said earlier, give you a few tools to use back on the job. So while I'm waiting for my screen to come to life, would you go to the next one? And here's my issue. Not all decisions are alike. The, one of the ways to think about this thing is there are times when we're going to make absolutely intuitive decisions. We're going to make decisions that are, you know, who do I hire? Who do I fire? Who do I promote? Uh, it's not going to be done on the numbers. It's going to be done on how our intellect and our gut work together to tell us who's the right person to do something like this. Second type of decision that's sitting out there is when we really get involved with something that's quite technical. Um, and this, you know, think in terms of the last time you went to get a loan at a bank um, and you put in some answers to some questions and I know I went recently for a home equity loan and within 90 minutes, or 90, excuse me, 90 seconds, they came back and they said, yes, you're qualified. So there's an algorithm running in the background, perfectly technical in that regard. In our world that we're talking about today, we're going to talk more about the whole issue of managerial decision making. This is the whole issue of, you know, how do I run a project? How do I uh, set up a budget? And it's going to be how do I, how do I, how do I? So focus on you as the individual. The bottom line there on the bureaucratic decision making, and unfortunately, sometimes we think bureaucratic is a bad thing. The reality of bureaucratic decision making is simply saying we need a lot of people. Um, we need bureaus to run governments. We need departments to run a company. And so if you think of an example on that one, uh, you could come up with something that is basically like an acquisition, and that's where, that's where a bureaucratic decision would be taking us. So four kinds of decisions. Um, the one that we're going to focus on the most um, is going to be the one that's dealing with uh, managerial decision-making. And now, Lauren, let us see if this slide will advance for me. All right. And I'm back in control. I love it. Um, so real quick question for you. If you would just put in as far as what I have just said, and if you're actually listening to me, is a promotion a good example of a technical decision, yes or no? Right. And Lauren, after we get a bunch of answers, if you would just throw up the, the answers on the screen, and then we can move from there. I sure will. So everybody take a look at your screen. You have the ability to vote live, so choose true or false. A promotion is a good example of a, of a technical decision. So I'll give you about three more seconds to vote. Two, one. All right, let's look at the answers. All right, Bill, what do you see on your end? What I see on that, the great majority of the people are right on the mark. They're actually listening to me, and they said it's false. A promotion, by and large, um, is going to be an intuitive decision. Uh, we might try to back it up with numbers, but our gut is going to tell us where we're going to go on this. So, good, you're listening. Second piece that we want to do here is quick chat. As we're going to focus on the issue of managerial decisions, I gave you a couple of examples. Um, give me a couple of examples back what you think would be a managerial decision in your world, please. All right. And Bill, just to clarify, you don't necessarily have to be a manager to make a managerial decision. Is that correct? Oh, my gosh, no. No. Uh, it's really a decision, ind an individual decision for the business, uh, and it could be for, for yourself, for a team. So individual contributors would be in there as well. Wonderful. Okay. So while we're waiting for everybody to jump in on the chat, let's go to the next survey. All right. So the next survey says, what kinds of decisions do you make most often in your work? So you have four choices here, intuitive, technical, managerial, and bureaucratic. So feel free to vote here as we wait for answers to come in for our last question. Give you about five seconds more here. Three, two, one. Okay, let's look at the results. All righty. Um, 
all the way between, so about 40% are managerial, 40% are intuitive, um, and not surprisingly, there's not much as far, in the far as the world of bureaucratic is concerned. So there we go. Okay. For those of you who have been intuitive in your decision making, let's kind of roll you into the world of what's going on with managerial decision making. So let me, let me go straight to the next one on this one and see how we're going. All right. I'd like you to consider a, a simple four-phase process. Um, and it's, it's intuitively obvious, but I will tell you from a, a bunch of years. By the way, as part of my introduction, I should have said how many years I, I've spent doing different things. So really quickly, five years in the Marine Corps, five years doing honest to God engineering, 20-some years doing consulting, 15 years or so doing education. Um, I'm an OOG. I'm an official old guy. So I've been around business for quite some time. Um, and what I realize is that we don't follow processes that much. But here's four things for you to consider as you're making a decision. Note the issue. Explore the options. Key piece on this one is options. Um, go ahead and decide and then track and, and learn from your decisions. And I'm going to give you a tool or something to think about in each one of these particular areas. Underlying all of these four pieces is your need to build and use influence. And I'll tell you right now, one of the problems that I've seen in businesses around the world is I get <clears throat> excuse me, a bunch of middle managers who sometimes want to say, you know what, I can't make that decision. I'm not allowed to make that decision. Well, I'm sorry, you may not make the decision, but it is absolutely your responsibility to influence good decision-making in your organization. So the key there is don't let yourself off the hook. Let's go on to the first one. So the first one of knowing the issue is really saying, do, do we really know what we're trying to achieve and the impact of what we're trying to achieve on the business? And I will tell you, oftentimes we chase fads. Oftentimes we chase symptoms. Um, oftentimes we don't dig deep enough into what's the real issue that's there. So let me give you a hypothetical. Here's the hypothetical situation. Um, we are sitting there, and all of a sudden, we, whether it's a retail or operation or a restaurant or whatever the case might be, we've got a bunch of stores, and we're getting a drop in same-store sales. And you want to know why, because you're going to have to make some decision as to how to fix this problem that you've got. So when you talk to the people around your organization, you're going to get answers like this. You're going to get marketing people who say, you know, the problem is we don't advertise enough. And you're going to get operations people going to say for a restaurant, the problem is the kitchen is old and slow. And the menu management people, the problem is we are not trendy enough. As you look at these three problem descriptions, what you should notice is, is that, and this is so true in most organizations, people see the problem through the lens of what they do. And oftentimes, as I put here, you know, the marketing people say, well, the problem is obviously we don't have a big enough budget and we should be advertising more. Um, be careful. Don't define the problem as the absence of your solution. Too often in decision-making, we start with a solution and we should back off. So here's the tool that I'd like you to think about. But before we do that, so of these three, marketing operations and menu management, who do you think is right? And as before, vote. Put your two cents in. And then, Lauren, when you get a bunch of them, let's go to the results. All right. Sounds good. They're coming in. I think people are trying to decide. It's not a trick question. <laughs> go ahead and vote. I'll give you three more seconds. Three, two. One. All right, let's go to the results. Hey, Bill, what do you see? Well, um, actually, I would say I would reverse those percentages. Um, I don't think any one of them, all of them, well, I don't think all of the above are right because it can't be those three separate things. The point there is that, and I think everybody got it, it's not from marketing, it's not from operations, it's not from menu management. Um, we don't know what the problem is. We absolutely don't know. So here's the tool. 
and I've been using this tool for for quite some time, um, and it's it's amazing to me. I've got something that is really intellectually obvious and hard to do. So when I run workshops for organizations, um, oftentimes I'll, I'll give them an example and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then I'll say, let's take one of your problems and draw a cause map. And, and the beauty behind cause mapping is that all we need to know are two words. We need to know the word why, and we know, need to know the word because. And we're going to keep using these words on and on and on until we get through a situation. So let me give you my simple example here. So we've got a drop in same-store sales, and we ask why. And well, you think about this thing from a business perspective, business perspective, remember. Well, it's either we've got lower guest count, fewer people are coming into the restaurant, or we've got a lower average ticket. When they come in, they're buying less. And maybe it could be both, all right? So I got a why and I got a because. Now let's take the first one, that's the lower guest count, and do the same thing again. Why? Well, now we've got a larger series of becauses. Why do we have fewer people coming in? Well, because it's a population shift. Maybe this is Detroit. People have left the city and there's just fewer people to come into the restaurant. Or maybe... This is a neighborhood that's going through gentrification or this is a neighborhood that's changing its ethnic group uh, and it's what was appealing to one group is no longer appealing to another group. Or, and, there's fewer people that want to eat in. And, or, there's fewer drive through people. So you could, again, do why, because, why, because. Let's go for the second one. Why do you think there's less, excuse me, why do you, third one, I'm sorry, um, I changed the, the screen on this one. Why are there fewer eat-in customers? We take it again. Well, there's fewer eat-in customers because there's a dirty facility. Well, why is the facility dirty? Well, because it's understaffed. Why is the facility understaffed? Oh, because the owner is in financial trouble. And if I took it one more step out, and this is a true example, why is the owner in financial trouble? Because she's going through a divorce. So it started off as somebody from marketing saying, gee, maybe we ought to change the menu, turned out to be, gee, maybe we ought to get marital counseling for the owner. So when you think in terms of this, cause mapping is a tool, I'm just going to tell you, use it. Now, in this 30 minutes that we've got together, we don't have enough time to, to go into all the details behind it. So on this slide, you'll see I say, if you want to learn it, go to thinkreliability.com. This little company down in Houston, Texas is brilliant. And if you want to see some really cool cause maps, they did a cause map on the sinking of the Titanic. They did a cause map on the financial meltdown. They did a cause map on the woman that got burned um, with, by spilling coffee in her lap at a McDonald's 20 years ago. Great examples, and they do tutorials online for free. So you can't beat the price, and you certainly, I highly recommend them. So think reliability. Dot com as a place to go. So while that settles in, let me turn the page and let's think about the next step on this four phases that we've got there. The set, next piece there is to think in terms of the whole issue of options, plural. And my comment there on the second bullet is, says how might we is something that should be added to your vocabulary. Here's the, here's the point that's here. Way too often, we come across um, with an idea and we say, let's do it, and we turn a problem and the decision into a yes or no. It becomes binomial. Should we or shouldn't we? I really suggest that you spend some time trying to explore four different options. So the four options that I, I work with all the time on corporations, and I just did this last week with a financial services firm, um, you always have the option of doing nothing. Or you have an option of doing something that's safe. It's Let's do something we've done before. We could have coupons for sales, or we could have a, a, a layoff for some of our people if we need to cut, cut costs or things such as that. The ones I want to push people to are doing something that's unusual. And my definition of unusual or wild basically is 
simply saying it's something we've never done before. Others may have, but we haven't done this. The fourth option that you should at least consider is to take a high-risk, high-upside option. And then the key piece there is to vet them. And in about three more slides, I'm going to give you the tool as to how to do this thing. So when we get to this piece, um, first of all, I'd like to, to get your point of view as to, so I've given you four options, you know, so we'll go back to it, status quo, preferred, unusual, or high risk. Why do you think I would want people to go and have four options? So would you throw some commentary into the chat, please, and let's see what you come up with. So while we're waiting for everybody to put these in, um, which of the four options do you see being most prevalent with the companies you work with, Bill? Well, the, the, the most prevalent is we, we tend to do something that's safe because we're, and I've had a, 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 the chief financial officer of a Fortune 50 company tell me, he says, I will take as many wild ideas as people will give me, but they're afraid to give me wild ideas because of, I, I've got the money to vet, to vet them and to, to try them out, but people think if I come up with something wild and it doesn't work, it's going to hurt my career. So we tend in, in corporations to really stay on the safe side of things. Um, mm -hmm. Where you'll see other businesses are the ones that are growing significantly and are new. So Google does crazy things. Amazon does crazy things. All the, all the current hot topic organizations don't do things that are safe. They do things that are wild and risky. Sure. So did you get any comments? We have a few. Um, not all situations are the same, so we need options to choose from. Do you agree with that? Um, yes, yes. Um, let me, so let me just jump you to this. Uh, I've got to pay attention how much time we're taking here. Sure. Um, I want to jump you to where, where I think are, are pieces that are sitting out there. So the four options, why four options? I think there's two reasons for that. One of them is this whole issue of premature closure. Um, we sometimes, as I said before, we come up with an idea, we try to satisfy, um, and we go to yes or no immediately. And I think in decision-making, you got to spend at least a little bit of time standing back and looking at the situation and, and exploring the options. My second bullet here says give the nine-year-old kid a chance. A good, when it comes to strategic thinking, back to this whole point about you know, the, the, the survey we did and why good decision-making because it should tie into strategic initiatives and people agree with that. The, the heart of good strategy is doing new things. If all you do is benchmark and all you do is continuous improvement, the best you're going to do is be as good as your competition. If you want to be better than your competition, you've got to try new stuff. As a nine-year-old, and if somebody gave you a cardboard box, that stinking cardboard box could be anything you wanted it to be. It could be a spaceship. It could be a jail for your little brother. It could be a cave. It could be anything you wanted it to be. And then you went to school for 16, 18, 20 years, and instead of being evaluated on your imagination, you got evaluated on coming up with right answers. Well, I'm sorry. In some issues with, with strategy, there are no right answers from history. We're going to have to go invent this stuff. So we're back to my point about put this into your lexicon, how might we, is real key on doing things. Once you've got the four, let's see if this will work. Once you've got the four ideas sitting down behind you, here's a simple tool. This is the second tool I'm, I'm giving you. So the first one was do cause mapping. The second one is Learn to vet your alternatives. And when I ask people to vet their alternatives, this particular picture, um, I have spent days with organizations with only this on the screen. We could do nothing. What we, can we expect to get? What are the pros and cons? What evidence is there in the, for the pros? What evidence is there for the cons? What assumptions are we making? And what risks are we going to take? And then you do it for the preferred option, the unusual option, and the risky option. If you get somebody in the organization that simply says, well, I think we should do this, or I think this was a bad reason, 
as soon as they say, I think, that's not evidence. That's an assumption. So pay attention to opinion versus true evidence. Uh, by the way, this particular tool, uh, Ascendus has uh, on their LMS an opportunity to do some subscription sign-ups. And this tool and explanations behind this tool are sitting on the Ascendus um, LMS. And we can, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the session. So step one on this thing, you know, is the whole issue of know what the issue is, cause mapping. Step two on this thing says, hey, explore your options. Sit there and, and think this thing through. As we get to step three, or phase three, or however you want to put it, we've got to spend some time thinking in terms of the risks we're about to take um, and what is it about this preferred option that we want to go after and how do, we have to be care, how do we have to be careful about it? Let me raise two issues on this one. Um, but in the background here, so you've got a process. And part of this challenge here is not also what you should do, but what you should try to avoid. So before we do that, let me ask you a question regarding traps and biases. So if you would, once again, and this particular one, um, Pick as well. Pick whatever you think is the correct answer. So our options here: all of us have biases. No one is fully aware of biases. Others see our biases, or all of the above, or none of the above. All right. I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results, and let's see. All right, so kind of all over the place this time. Well, I, I particularly like uh, the 50% of you that says um, all of the above. And I probably would tie that in with all of us have biases. But the, also the, the issue that's sitting out there, uh, and I'm going to tell you where this came from, uh, from the research that was done on this. Um, the top three are all correct. All of us have biases. We're not aware of them, but others can see them. And, and that third piece of others can see them makes it very, very valuable. So here's the piece that's sitting on there. When we think about using a checklist to think about this thing, um, awareness doesn't improve decision making, but checklists can improve decision making. I mean, think in terms of an air pilot getting in a plane, and this, this, she may have flown you know, 10,000 hours, but they have a checklist that they use on every time they take off. Um, at least they should. <laughs> I hope they do. Um, the, at the bottom of the screen is a, just a wonderful article from Harvard Business Review um, from Kahneman, Lavolo, and Savoni. And Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winner, and his, his material is really steeped in, in research. So I like his stuff to begin with. It's a wonderful article. What we're going to do is I'm going to touch on a couple of the things that are in each of these, in these different areas. But get the article, read it, and become much more aware of the bias that you're faced with. So one of the things is the we, questions we should ask ourselves. Um, you know, has the team fallen in love with its recommendation? Absolutely true in a lot of organizations. Once I've made a recommendation, I just, hey, it's mine. I love it. I own it. It's, it, it's good. Um, and then did the team allow and consider dissenting opinions? That one is kind of fascinating because think in terms of your organization. If you're running something that's really big and really important, and the vice president tells you how important it is, and you've got somebody out there that's a na that, that d disagrees. We tend to call them naysayers, and we exclude them from the conversation. And that's dangerous. So dissenting opinion is good. Um, we've, we have, uh, I wrote a book with Leo Hoff a few years back, and one of, the, one of our chapters we've got, in this book, it's called Rethink, Reinvent, Reposition. It's a book about renewing a business. We wrote about the whole issue of consensus is evil. Because if all we do is come, try to come to consensus on our decisions, we will come to a very watered down decision where everybody says, oh yeah, I can live with that. If you want to make some great decisions, allow people to vet their opinions as to what's good and what's bad about that particular decision. 
In the article, there are more things about Ask Yourself. You can read the article and take it there. On the bias checklist for the people who are at making recommendations, we've already talked about alternatives. Remember, there's four of them. Do nothing, do something safe, do something unusual, or do something risky. And then back to the point of vetting your sources, um, you know, think in terms of, of the sources that we used that got us into Iraq. I don't care where you're on the political spectrum, but the point was we assumed, assumed that there were weapons of mass destruction, um, and we should have done a better job of vetting the sources that were telling us that there were. Okay, excuse me, I had to get some water there. My throat is running dry. The third area to think about is the proposal that's sitting out there. And we talk about kind of the extremes. Of, is something too optimistic? If somebody can, has come to us re, with a recommendation and they can't tell us what's wrong with it, i got a problem with that one because nothing is ever perfect. Um, and then sometimes recommending teams are just afraid to go out on a limb and you need to push them just a little bit to help them get out there. So that's a piece to think about. Third area where we're going to play with is that the, the issue there is you are rarely the sole decision maker. Um, and so this whole issue there, as I put there, you know, you have stakeholders that have to be influenced for the betterment of the decision. It's your responsibility to influence. You may not have the opportunity to make the decision, but if you know or feel as something should be done, don't let yourself off the hook. Um, I'm sorry, uh, that would put me in, to put you into the category of, of managerial cowardice. And I don't like to talk about that kind of issues in corporations. We've got mm -hmm. enough of that in our political world. I'll leave that one alone. All right, when we think in terms of influencing, um, here is just common channels that are sitting out there. Uh, you know, we can influence because we're the boss. We can influence because we can rationally explain things. We can influence because people want to go with us because we've got great visions. Uh, we influence people who we have relationships with. It's very hard to influence people we don't have relationships with unless we're the boss or can do the other three above you. Uh, sometimes we influence people because they need stuff. And frankly, to be all totally honest with you, sometimes we can influence people because we've got clout. Uh, I was born and raised in the city of Chicago. I understand clout. I don't like it but it works. The question that's sitting out there um, for all of you, and I'd like you to just kind of help me do some research on this one. When you look at your organization and you think in terms of yourself, what works best for you? So if you just take a second there, and we're coming close to the end on my stuff here, so we're right on time. Um, what works inside of your organization? Right, so the answers are coming in pretty quickly here. Give you three more seconds. Two, one. All right, let's go to the results. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, uh, <laughs> I love this idea of relationships. And, and um, think in terms of... Um, building your network. And, and one of the, I'll go off onto a tangent for 12 seconds. One of the problems that I have with um, so much being done via, tele, deep, via technology, I'll just leave it at that, is we don't get the chance to build real relationships. And I don't know where you are in your, your career, but my standard routine for people early in their career is build your network. Um, I, can, I can tell you now, I still go back to people I worked with at Ernst & Ernst, all right? For those of you who are in the CPA world, that's a long time ago. So it was in 1977. I still go back to people and ask them questions and help it, use them for, for sounding boards. Um, networks are great, uh, and so real relationships, absolutely right on the mark. Um, don't forget there's other ways to do it, and you may want to think about that as well as time goes by. All right. So let me wrap things up here, kind of bring things back a little bit. Uh, let's get to this next screen. All right. Not all decisions are alike. We went at the very beginning of this 20-some minutes I've been with you so far. 
um, sometimes it's it, purely intuitive. Um, it's quick and it's a gut check. Um, intuitive decisions, by the way, are best made by people who have experience. A lot of us have opinions, but if you're not relatively well experienced in your particular area, whether it's operations or marketing or accounting or things like that, be careful of your intuition. It may not be fully formed yet. Um, so we'll just leave it at that. Technical decisions, usually cut and dried, we can build them into an algorithm. And on both managerial and bureaucratic decisions, there's checklists that always can help. And once again, uh, if we went back to the Ascendus LMS offering that's out there, I've got a checklist for pending decisions that, um, that you may want to download and, and grab onto. Okay, so last phase on this one then um, is, and unfortunately most, I shouldn't say most, many organizations do not spend the time to learn from both good and bad decisions. And so when you think in terms of this thing, uh, here's my fourth tool trick or, excuse me, my fourth tool for you. This comes from the military. Um, after uh, major training exercises or major combat exercises, the military unit gets together and they deal with four questions. What do we want? What did we get? Why were they different? What did we learn? The point behind decision making is you're never going to be perfect from the get-go. You're not even going to be perfect later on in your career, but that does not let you off the hook from becoming better and better and better over time. So track and learn from your decisions, whether they were good or they were bad. What did we get? Excuse me. What did we want? What did we get? Why were they different? What did we learn? You'll notice the question that's not here of who do we blame. That's the one that kind of rolls out way too quickly in too many organizations and the government and other places. Don't waste your time. Don't try to blame somebody. Just get, get this thing over with and done with and learn from it. So let me take you back to this bottom line of mine. Um, as we think about this thing and you think about decision making, um, Find the root causes, learn how to do cause maps. Vet multiple options. To some, you could do nothing, something safe, something unusual, something risky. Um, learn how to use your influence. You have it. You should use it. It's your responsibility. Um, and then from all of your decisions, both good and bad, you, you're going to learn. I will tell you, I've been around business a long time. Um, I learned a lot more from bad decisions than I learned from good ones. 